This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh, as we spend the rest of the hour with author and Yale University history professor Samuel Moyne. He's just published a remarkable book, Humane. How the United States Abandoned Peace and Reinvented War. It looks at how the U.S. created a world of endless wars and helped reinvent the rules of war. The book came out earlier this week, just after the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, after nearly two decades of occupation and days ahead of the 20th anniversary of the September 11th attacks and the launch of the so-called War on Terror. Professor Samuel Moyne, welcome to Democracy Now! It's great to have you with us. Start off by talking about this very revealing title, Humane, How the United States Abandoned Peace and reinvented war. Well, Amy, the United States has been at war since before it even existed against native peoples and later beyond its borders, and especially since World War II, America has been at war globally. Uh, but all those wars were brutal in the extreme, and there were no rules prohibiting brutal conduct uh, by design. Uh, what happened after 2001 is that in the midst of an extremely brutal war on terror, a new kind of war emerged. And it was one in which, really for the first time, uh, it was important to Americans to see their wars fought more humanely in conformity with uh, international rules that prohibit torture, that limit civilian death. And the worry is that even though this represents a kind of progress, it also helped uh, Americans sustain war uh, and help make the war on terror endless, even though uh, Joe Biden has withdrawn troops. He's promised to continue the war on terror in other ways. Uh, Samoan, you also make the argument that uh, a more humane war, this idea of a more humane war, uh, has accompanied an increasingly interventionist foreign policy. So if you could elaborate on that and also uh, the fact that you detail in the book of the role of human rights organizations in uh, advancing this view, uh, Human Rights Watch, for example, which you say initially uh, didn't take any position on war, uh, but then came to support certain humanitarian interventions. So I would start the, the story with Vietnam, which was a much more brutal war, illegal in the international system, but also in blatant violation uh, with lots more torture than the war on terror and a lot more civilian death. And there was an anti-war movement in response to it, uh, and the revelations of the My Lai massacre, which were so horrifying, added fuel to the fire of that anti-war movement. But then George McGovern, the peace candidate, really the last peace candidate we've had in this country, lost badly. And Democrats came to learn the lesson, I think the wrong lesson that they needed to be as interventionist as the Republicans uh, uh, whom they were fighting for power. Uh, and so we see across the later years of the Cold War and into the 1990s um, high-minded rationales for American intervention, even though many of these interventions, like the Kosovo bombings, violated the international rules that prohibit the use of force. And the question I'm posing is whether we've forgotten about those rules, even as we've come to focus on the rules that say, once you go to war, you, you can't fight brutally. Human Rights Watch is an excellent example of, of, of these, let's say, imbalanced priorities. So when it began monitoring wars in the 1980s and 90s, it promised never to take a stand on whether the wars themselves are unjust or indeed illegal. Um, but they did say they would monitor whether wars are conducted illegally, whether there's torture, whether there's excess collateral damage. Now, it's also true, as you mentioned, Nermeen, that 
Human Rights Watch has sometimes strayed from that commitment and endorsed some great power wars. But my question is whether alongside groups like Human Rights Watch that we need monitoring the conduct of wars, how they're fought, whether we need to get back some of the anti-war sentiment that was present in American history, at least um, intermittently before. After all, the laws of war uh, are incredibly permissive. What they allow states to do once war begins is extraordinarily violent, even when it's supposedly humane. And also remember that soldiers die, not just civilians, on both sides. Uh, and so it, our ancestors sometimes said, we really need to keep war from happening. And it's that lesson that we've stopped learning in the age of the war on terror when we've let the humanity of our wars uh, compensate for the fact that they just keep on going. Well, Sam, uh, one of the other arguments you make is that, uh, and also this is a continuation of the effects of the Vietnam War, that once the draft was ended in the U.S., uh, the military uh, here embraced humanitarian laws of war uh, in an unprecedented fashion. You write, quote, a self-humanization of armed force without precedent in the history of any great power. Could you elaborate on that and explain why that was the case? So th this period of the later 60s and the 1970s was pivotal for the morality of how uh, war is fought around the world. Partly, there were all kinds of new states after decolonization, and they were made up of peoples who'd been the victims of brutal American and European wars for centuries, and they demanded more humanity. Europeans had stopped uh, their, you know, empires and relied on the United States to protect them, and so they were in position to uh, ask for more humane wars now that they were no longer fighting them. Uh, Americans, uh, including in the military, understood that military force had to be inflicted in, in, in a more ethical or at least more optically um, humane way, because My Lai was such a public relations disaster for the military. Uh, people were shocked before it was permissible to uh, inflict the most kind of brutal violence on enemies, especially if they were non-white enemies around the world. And Americans celebrated when that violence was perpetrated. After Me Lai, the military realized it needed to accept some constraints on the way it fights um, in the name of being able to claim that uh, it was it was a moral force. And so it was utterly important that even as humanitarians in Human Rights Watch and other groups stopped caring about whether there was American war and focusing on how it was fought, so too the military, which wants to keep its missions going, uh, was willing to accept some constraints on how those missions are conducted. I wanted to turn, uh, Professor Moyne, to President Obama's Nobel Prize speech. It was December 10th, 2009, um, when President Obama received the Nobel Peace Prize in Oslo, Norway. This is a clip from his acceptance speech. We must begin by acknowledging a hard truth. We will not eradicate violent conflict in our lifetimes. There will be times when nations, acting individually or in concert, will find the use of force not only necessary, but morally justified. Where force is necessary, we have a moral and strategic interest in binding ourselves to certain rules of conduct. And even as we confront a vicious adversary that abides by no rules, I believe the United States of America must remain a standard bearer in the conduct of war. That is what makes us different from those whom we fight. That is a source of our strength. That is what makes us different from those we fight. That is a source of our strength. You repeatedly reference, Professor Moyne, this uh, Nobel 
acceptance speech in your book. Can you talk about the significance of this and the intensification of the drone wars? So what, what, what fascinates me about Barack Obama is that he was a public moralist and he thought publicly about the moral significance of law in particular. Uh, and he talked about it in that extraordinary address, as well as the one uh, four years later defending the use of drones. Now, Obama famously wanted to see himself as an heir of Martin Luther King Jr., and in certain ways he was. He claimed or uh, uh, repeated the, the belief that the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice. But where King had disputed the use of, of force when it's immoral, uh, going to war in the case of Vietnam, not just how uh, American force was used. Obama ignored the first issue or justified eternal war, as you heard, and focused on the second, uh, as if how Americans fight uh, would guarantee the moral pri pr propriety of the endless wars uh, they're still fighting today. When it came to 2013, uh, he gave uh, an equally remarkable speech at the National Defense University. Let me go to said, that clip, because we happen to have it. Yes, in May uh, of 2013, um, at National Defense University, the one that the well-known peace activist Medea Benjamin of Code Pink interrupted. Uh, this is President Obama. When, when we, we went, he, he, he went on to, we went on, We're addressing that, ma'am. You know, I think that the, uh, and I'm going off script as you might expect here. Um, the, uh, uh, the voice of that woman uh, is worth paying attention to. Obvious, obviously, uh, obviously, I do not agree with much of what she said. And obviously, she wasn't listening to me in much of what I said. But these are tough issues. And the suggestion that we can gloss over them is wrong. And that audience member, I dare say he knew exactly who she was, Code Pink's Medea Benjamin. If you had trouble hearing, saying thousands of Muslims that got killed, will you compensate the innocent families? That will make us safer here at home. She said, I love my country. Drone strikes are making us less safe. Keeping people in indefinite detention is making us less safe. Samuel Moyne. Again, it, it's it's a, such a morally dramatic moment, not least because you might wonder after hearing that exchange, which one of them really deserve the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, but what I write about in my book, because I think that moment was in a way the the climax of Obama's presidency, at least you know judged at, at, as a moment when he was morally reflecting on his deeds. He. He he conceded uh, that uh, that that there 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 needs to be some control on war, and if you listen to her, mainly what she's asking is for um, less inhumanity. What's amazing is that Obama himself goes on in the speech to say maybe the problem is not so much the brutality of the drones, but that we're fighting endless war at all. Because, he says, 
uh, these kinds of wars will have effects not just on our victims, but on the perpetrators too. And he anticipated, I think, in that address, if you read it, the coming of Donald Trump uh, uh, as as a kind of you know um, a, a kind of consequence of what happens when nations uh, fight endless war. And sadly, we're still doing it. We just have a second, Sam, but could you elaborate on that? Why is Trump an effect of that endless war? Well, so as, as Spencer Ackerman and so many others have written and, and talked about on your show, uh, uh, wars fought are, are never without consequences for the states that fight them, uh, even though, of course, we should be concerned for, first and foremost about those who die or those who are merely surveilled and haunted. Uh, by uh, drones and special forces. This really matters because it's essential that when Biden gave his two speeches the other week uh, defending the pullout from Afghanistan, he made utterly clear that while giving up on failed counterinsurgency, he's turning to and maybe will intensify himself the the real fruit uh, of 9-11, which is kind of endless counterterror no matter what the constraints of international law say, unless they require the drones to strike or the special forces to visit with care for the victims. Samuel Moyenwana, thank you for being with us. His new book, Humane, How the United States Abandoned Peace and Reinvented War, professor of law and history at Yale University. Tomorrow, Congresswoman Barbara Lay. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh.